الله الله لا اله الا الله الله بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم شهر رمضان الذي انزل فيه القران هدى للناس صدق الله العظيم which means the month of ramadan is when the quran has been revealed as a guidance for mankind so you see when allah talks about the month of ramadan and ramadan is the only month that is named specifically in the quran and so it must be something unique something special but what is special about it and then he says shahru ramadan alladhi unzila fihi alquran which means that in the month of ramadan the specialness of this month is not the fasting is not the hari raya is not the uh, baju kurung is not the bazaar at gelang but it is the quran because the association of this month allah chose when he speaks of the month of ramadan shahru ramadan alladhi unzila fihi alquran is because of the quran so the main point the main purpose of the month of ramadan is in the celebration of the revelation of the quran to mankind right? and so fasting the place of fasting is a way to manifest that form of celebration by fasting in order for us to receive the quran right so because when you when we fast we purify ourselves physically right? we eat little and we also purify ourselves spiritually we perform more ibadah more good deeds uh, more in, in this month the tarawih for example and then the lightul uh, then, then the qiyamul lail in lailatul qadar and all these acts are to purify purify us spiritually and so this is an act to celebrate the month of the quran right and so uh, it is also in this month that if you notice that the change of qibla in the month of shaaban was given to the muslims as a way to give the new muslim community then a new identity from batul maqdis to makkah and also in this month of shaaban that the revelation of uh, the verse of uh, fasting which is uh, surah al-baqarah chapter 2 verse 183 was also given in preparation for the real month of fasting which is ramadan right. so with this performance of fasting in the month of ramadan and with the new qibla now that has been uh, uh, commanded for muslims to face kaaba so we have a complete ummah a new developed ummah and although fasting is not a new deed right because allah says in uh, chapter 1 it uh, verses 1 and 3 ya ayuhal ladhina amanu kutiba alaykum siyamu kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqun sarak allah azim which means ya ayuhal ladhina amanu o you who believe kutiba alaykum siyam fasting has now been made compulsory upon you kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum as it has been made compulsory to communities that came before you so we know that it is not new it has been it has been done but the manner in which it is being done is different because the sharia is different from the people of the past and when the change of the kaaba and the verse is being revealed in shaaban both of these events it marks a departure although the act of fasting is the same but because there is a new community in the development of uh, of of mankind in the development of men's relationship with god and when the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam came with islam so the sharia and the method of performing it is different so we know that first and foremost the month of ramadan is to celebrate the month of the quran now so we are tasked to talk about the verse in surah al-baqarah chapter 2 verse 2 in which allah says alif lam mim dhalika al-kitabu la raiba fi hudan lil muttaqin dhalika kitabu la raiba fi it has been sent this is the book that has been sent to mankind without doubt hudan lil muttaqin as a guidance for those who are muttaqin for those who are taqwa and so you see before we talk about the book in itself let's see why this book has been given to us dhalika al kitab la raiba fi hudan lil muttaqin so that it will be a guidance for those who are muttaqun and muttaqun is the plural form of taqwa and so if we step back a little bit and we think about what fasting in this month of ramadan does and in the verse which i recited earlier the purpose of ramadan is la'an lakum tattaqun so that we may become people of taqwa and so fasting leads us to inshallah a state of taqwa and the quran has been given to us as a guidance for people who are also of taqwa and so why is taqwa important 
how do we understand what taqwa means? And we see every Friday, the khatib will say, Oh, uh, dear blessed, blessed jama'ah, let us have taqwa to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? By performing all that we are asked to perform, that has been commanded, and to avoid all that we have been prohibited by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And where do we find this commandment or this prohibition? And one of the major source of reference for Muslims is the Quran. Right? And in another incident, um, Abu Hurara was asked, what is taqwa? Instead of answering that question, he asked the questioner back. He said, have you ever walked on a path and that path is full of thorns? And then the questioner said, yes, of course I have. And then Abu Hurara asked, uh, so what do you do? And so he replied, well, I try to avoid every step of the way from the thorns so that I don't get pricked by it. And so Abu Hurairah said, well, that is taqwa. That means avoiding from sins. And here we are fasting the whole day, today. It's one of the acts of piety, one of the acts of consciousness. And on a day-to-day -day basis, on, on every hour, every, every minute, where we have to make a decision to avoid something which is prohibited, that is an act of taqwa. And why is this important? Because in Surah Al-Hujrat, Allah says, Inna akramakum indallahi atqaqum. For verily, in the eyes of Allah, the most honorable amongst you are those with taqwa. And so, in the, in the last day, in the day of judgment, when we are all made to stand, waiting to be accounted, the only thing that differentiates us is not what is your nationality, is not the color, is not your height, is not your gender, is not the color of your eyes, but it is taqwa. And hence the importance of taqwa. And the beautiful thing about fasting in the month of Ramadan is that by fasting, by and large, automatically you get disciplined into the process of acquiring the sense of taqwa because on a, on a regular basis while you're fasting, you're always engaging. You're always in a state of zikrullah. You're always asking yourself, can I do this? Should I not do that? Is this something that's encouraged? So in that engagement, you will be, inshallah, and within the 30 days, will be transformed. And so this becomes the medicine. If you want to get close to Allah, if you want to increase our level of taqwa to Allah, one of the ways in which we can acquire this is through fasting. Right? Remember, because the aim of fasting is la'an lakum tatakun. And the importance of taqwa is that at the end of the day, this is how we will be distinguished before Allah's eyes who is better than the next. And this is profound because can you tell when you're sitting here while waiting for iftar, whether your brother on your right or your brother on the left has more taqwa than you? Can you tell? You can't. And this is the beauty in Islam. You cannot tell because it's not your job to decide. It's not your job to judge. Your job is just to pursue and to persevere and to carry on on the path of attaining taqwa. And as a fellow brother who has a relationship with his other brothers in this world, is that when you find your fellow brothers or sisters who needs help to be on this path of taqwa, your role is to lend that helping hand and extend it and bring him or her along with you. And so all this is reduced to the same denominator because in that verse that we mentioned earlier, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fil Qur'an hudal linnas. So it has been revealed, the Qur'an has been revealed in the month of Ramadan as a guidance for minnas, for mankind. It is not only for the Muslims. It is also for the non-Muslims. Because anyone who wants to know what is the teachings of Islam, anyone who wants to know what is the message that is contained in the Qur'an, will be able to go to any bookshop, whatever language he wants to find out about the Qur'an, about Islam, he can purchase the Qur'an, unlike maybe some other religious traditions that we know of. Right? So you can even go to a non-Muslim bookshop, for example, across the street, Kinokuniya, or popular bookstore. You'll be able to find translations of the Qur'an, and you can have access to it. And this is how flat the hierarchy in Islam is. And the coming of the Qur'an as hudal li nas, as guidance to mankind, obviate any claims that other race or other religions or even Muslims make that we are the chosen one, we are the special one. It cannot be. 
because the message is for the salvation of all of humanity and so the Quran was given to mankind as guidance so we see in Surah Al-Baqarah Allah says Alif la mim dhalikal kitabu la rayba fi hudalil muttaqin the importance of muttaqin and so we have a clue here that this will only be good guidance for us the Quran if hudalil muttaqin if we want it to be I mean everybody can read the Quran like I said but not everybody can accept, not everybody can, can think about, can reflect the message that is contained within the Quran. Why some can and some cannot? Because in the purity of their hearts, they want to be guided. And as Muslims, in our hearts and through our actions, we manifest the faith, we manifest the struggle and the strive to always want to be a better human being than before. That's why the Quran says, Hudalil muttaqin guidance only for those who are of taqwa meaning if you want it you will get it otherwise we can read the quran we can memorize the quran from the first juzu till the end but if we don't understand it if we don't practice it if we don't manifest it it will not be useful for us okay, okay. so then let's look at why then in this chapter in this verse allah refers to the quran as a kitab and so today in this uh, whole series in al Falah pre iftar talk we want to engage with you the other various names of the quran and some of the characteristics that's involved that make allah call the quran in these names so kitab why is it a kitab first you remember, if you look at history you'll find during the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the Quran was not compiled into books as we have it today, right? And so the effort was only made after much persuasion to Sayyidina Abu Bakr and then it was eventually materialized and compiled and as you have it today is from the copy, which that's why we call it the uh, Uthmani uh, version of the Quran because that's the version that Sayyidina Uthman uh, spread throughout the empire. But why Kitab? Why is it a book? Now, if you think about a book, now all of you know what a book is. And a book means that it is not only something that is memorized and it's something that you utter, but it exists in a physical form. Right? So the Quran that you hold, some of you are reading it now, is in the form of a book, a kitab. It is preserved in a physical form. So it is being written, it's being printed, and there you have it. Now, why? Is there a need for it to be in a preserved physical form because when we say there is a book then it signifies that the Quran is essentially a book of reference because if we just memorize every one of us memorize inshallah then if you want to make it as a point of reference then we have to know who memorized what right but because it's a book it's a kitab it is a physical entity, we can use it as a source of reference, we can even codex the index and we want to find something, we just Google it and the verse comes out. Right? And so that's why it's a kitab. And it is also as a source of preservation. Right? What else? Now, as a book, as a kitab, it connotes a collection. Right? So if you look at perhaps, uh, you know, every... Friday, when the Khatib read Surah Al A'la, when he talks about Suhufi Ibrahim wa Musa, right, the last verse, it's scrolls, scrolls of uh, Abrah uh, Nabi Ibrahim and the scrolls of Nabi Musa. Salam. So these are loose scrolls and loose papers, and this was how it was written in the past. But now, when Allah talks about the Quran as a kitab, it is really a collection, and a collection necessarily means that it reflects the completeness of the content of the collection. Because if it is not complete, you will not make it into a book. Right? So it de denotes the completeness of the message in the book. And therefore, in, this, in the theological sense, we say that the Quran relays the perfection of the message. And because you know, there's no more prophets, 
that will be sent. Nabi Muhammad SAW was the Khataman Nabiin, the seal of all the prophets. So when there's no prophet, there will be no message that, is, that can be sent to a prophet to make it into a divine book. So the Prophet Muhammad SAW being the last bearer of this vessel of receiving revelation, when this revelation is being compiled, then that becomes the most perfect of the message of Islam. Okay, okay. what else? Now, when you write a book, <coughs> surely there must be in your mind as an author, there is a plot, there is a method, there is a logic, there is a message that you want to send. Right? So when the Quran is referred to as a kitab, right? so that means in the message of the Quran, there is a logic. There is a method in which Allah engages. There is also a reasoning. There is also questioning for you to reflect. So in Kulia Zuhur today, we spoke about the method. If you look, we spoke about the change of the Qibla, but we look before that in the big dimension in which Surah Al-Baqarah was arranged. First part, Allah introduces the story of Nabi Adam alayhi It's important because it's the first story of man, or the story of the first man, and this is how we become, and the story of submission, the story of obedience to Allah's command. Right? The second, you'll find that followed down by the 40th verse, Allah talks about the lifting, the lifting of the special status of the Bani Israel. And so the Bani Israel think of themselves as a chosen people and so everything of themselves are special. But well, they still think of it now. But if you read the Quran, everybody is put on neutral ground and flat hierarchy. We are all the same. Right? And then, the beautiful plot in Surah Al-Baqarah. After that, Allah talks about Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam. And why? Because it's the Prophet that brings all these three big religions together. Right? He was the Prophet that gave birth, according to Western history, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Although for, from a Muslim point of view, we don't look at it this way because for us, Islam has started from the beginning. Right? And so he talks about Nabi Ibrahim with Nabi Ismail and the sacrifice and the building of the Kaaba. Why? Because at the end of the day, all of this Abrahamic faith goes back to this same point. Right? And then, after he established that, he talks about the changing of the Qibla. Right? Giving identity of the Muslims to themselves, giving them a capital, changing it from Batul Maqdis to Makkah. And so, and then after when we go down by the time we reach uh, the Surah of uh, Ramadan, Shahru Ramadan al Ladi, when he gives us the Quran, now we have as a Muslim community the capital our capital, which is Mecca, and we have the constitution, which is the Quran. So we are set. We are now a developed, complete, brand new Ummah. So even though we fast like the people fast before, and we pray like the people who in the past who prayed before, but our Sharia is different because we are distinct. Right? For example, in chapter 2, verse 24, Allah says, Ayyam ma'dudat. Fast a prescribed number of time. And this verse, if you look at the Arabic understanding of it, it is fast at a prescribed limited time. And Ayyama Ma'duda talks about 10 days or less. And now today we fast, is it 10 days? No, right? 30 days at least. I mean 28 to 30 days. So Allah is saying we are fasting, but because there's a new developed, new community, we have attained our own identity our own source and sense of reference, which is the Qur'an, and this then becomes our guide. Although we connect with the people of the past, because we also fast, and if you look at all our ibadah, it's really connecting to the past history. Salat, people fast, people pray since the beginning of time. Fast, in this verse we talk about fasting, and when we perform Hajj or Umrah. You know, when you perform Hajj or Umrah, it's not just a unique act that you do during your Hajj, but it's really to connect with the deeds which you related to back to Nabi Ibrahim, Nabi Ismail, you read to Hajar, you read to all the people and, and the Salaf of the time. So when you're performing that Tawaf, for example, you must be united with the Muslims of the past, with all the prophets in the past that did the same thing. And so when you pray Allahu Akbar, it's not simply just praying in this Masjid al falah but also you are connecting spiritually with all the fellow believers who have lived before you, who has gone before you, who has also done the same thing. And this is the message of unity 
This is the message of the oneness of Islam. Right? Okay. So, now, we spoke about this is the month of Quran. And we spoke about the importance of celebrating the Quran in this month. And we also spoke about um, uh, why Allah refers to the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah as Al-Kitab. A very significant point. And throughout this, the rest of this month, you'll see different asatiza coming up here, sharing with you the different names of the Quran and what it means. And so the question that beset us all, after knowing all this, would be, so what do we do with it? Always the question is, what do we do with it? Right? Sometimes Muslims are bogged down with trivial things, like for example, you know, mm. I want to be a good Muslim so I cannot be rich. No, that's not true. I want to be a good Muslim so I cannot own luxury. That's also not true. All the goodness in the world is also for the enjoyment of the Muslims. But the, but the one thing that distinguishes a believer and someone who don't believe is the question, what do I do with it? For example, with your wealth. And so we have the institution of zakat. Right? So you are, you're not supposed to be poor. If Muslims, all Muslims are poor, then what's the point? We make no impact in the world. Right? If no Muslims are successful, also what's the point? Then we become uh, absorber. We are never producing. We don't contribute. And that's not the characteristic of being a Muslim. So the question is, what do we do now that we know that Ramadan is the month of celebrating the Quran? One, increase our interaction with the Quran. How? Well, you are here uh, in the month of Ramadan. Even if you don't know how to read the Quran, when you do the, perform the Traweh with the Imam, even if you're not reading it, at least have an objective that you're going to khatam the Quran by at least listening. At least, if you cannot, or you don't have time. Right? But the best would be, you will also recite the Quran, and so inshallah you will khatam because that's following the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yeah, so that is the act that you need to aspire to become. Right? So one. So not only the reading, not only the listening, but understanding it as well. Right? There's no point reading, reading and reading, but know nothing about what the message is about. And there will be a failure on our part. Perhaps you, will, you, know, you might have an excuse that, oh, inshallah, says, I don't have time to study Arabic. Okay, fine. But just read it and then read the translation at least in the beginning. And make it a lifelong objective that I will learn so that I can understand what this means. Because in reality, for those who know the, the language, you will see that the translation cannot capture the full essence of what the verse means. And if you find, I mean, you look at the translations, different translator gives you different meanings to the verses, right? But if you know what it means, sometimes you don't even need to read the translation because you feel the gravity of this verse, for example. When Allah talks about uh, the pleasure of Jannah, and you feel that it's so light and it's so easy to read. And then when Allah talks about His, about his, about his anger, and you start to feel, mashallah, you know, a heaviness in your heart even though you didn't know the meaning of the, of, of the word. So it gives you a certain sense of taste. And so for every Muslim, it must be one of our objectives to learn the Quran, to be able to read it, and to be able to learn at least a little bit here and there, to strive to know the Arabic language. Then you'll be able to understand what the essence, what is the taste of revelation. And then, mashallah, I will promise you, once you are able to taste that revelation, you will not want to stop reading the Quran. Inshallah. Right? So that's the first, having an interaction. Two, knowing the meaning. And third, and this becomes the most important part of knowing and having an intimate, intimate uh, relationship with the Quran, which is after you read, after you understand, you must become the Quran. Your actions must be defined by the teachings in the Quran. What you say, what you do must have a basis that you know because of your reading of the Quran from the Quran. And then no one can tell you, can tell you otherwise because your basis, form of reference, the Quran tells you so. Do you understand what I'm saying? No one can tell you to do things which are out of Islam because why? Well, I know the Quran doesn't say so, so I'm not going to do it. You see the importance of knowing the Quran and the message? Because this must be your aim. One day, Sayyidina Aisha was asked, what is the morality 
what is the etiquette of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? And guess, how do you summarize? How do you summarize this great man who have shown us so much, who have introduced Islam to us, who have shown us the easy right way? Sayyidina Aisha simply said, his morality, his etiquette, his akhlaq is the Quran, mashallah. The theory of the book that we hold, that we read, is now inside the person embodied by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And that's why we say the, Quran, the Ramadan is the month of the Quran because you know, if you compare, I mean, I don't have time to compare about this verse because we talk about it in our Kula Zahur. If you compare in, in verse 184, when Allah says, I am a ma'dudat, and you fast for a short period of time, this is for the past generation, and then now, we fast for one whole month. And then Allah says in that, in that verse of Ramadan, Yuridu Allah bikumul yusra wa la yuridu bikumul asur. Allah aims to give you felicity, easiness, and He does not aim to make it difficult for you. And then we ask, Ya Allah, what do you mean? <laughs> because the fasting of the people of the past, ayyama ma'adudat, which is less than 10 days, and now we have to fast one whole month, this is more difficult. And I think and we don't have time to talk about this. And the people of the past in that verse 184, if you cannot fast, you pay back by qada, or you pay back by feeding the indigent or the poor. In verse 185, you only have one option. If you cannot fast because you're ill or you're on a journey, you qada. That's all. So it's more difficult, isn't it? In essence. But then Allah in the beautiful way says, He does not aim to make it difficult for you. And so the question we ask is, how is it made difficult, easy for us? It is made easy because of one very simple thing. We become easy when we become one dedicated ummah. What do I mean by this? Physically, I say it becomes easy because if we become one dedicated ummah. Why? How do we manifest this? Because in the month of Ramadan, at every moment, because of the movement of the globe, someone, a Muslim, is fasting, is obligatory fasting of Ramadan at any given time or any given second. And we manage to get through this whole day of fasting because we have this spiritual support from Muslims whom we don't even know, who's living in another part of the world whom you will never know until you die. But because they are fasting and here you are struggling in this last hour, right, trying to hold on to your fast, you were given this spiritual strength because every ummah, that united ummah called Muslims that was developed by the Prophet Muhammad SAW that we talked about just now, was fasting along with you. And that's why Allah says, You read Allah al Yusra, while you read al Asr. Because if you compare the fasting of the past, it was less, right? 10 days or less. I am a ma'dudat. And now, Shahru Ramadan, and then Allah says, When you spot the moon, fast. So that means one month. Second, and if they cannot, they can have two ways to pay back, by qada and also by feeding the poor. But in this generation, by qada, by verse 185. So technically it's difficult, but mashallah. When Allah moves hearts, our hearts will be moved. And one of the ways is this spiritual strength that we gain because everyone is fasting this moment in time. Try to fast, don't talk about other sunnah fasting. Let's talk about the shawal fasting of six days. It will be difficult, more difficult than the fast that you are doing now, correct? From your experience, why? Because not every Muslim is fasting at the same time. So you don't get that taste. You don't get that spiritual assistance as an ummah. And so, one of the important things that the Quran teaches us, one of the important things that Ramadan as a month teaches us, one of the important things that fasting teaches us is that as an ummah, it is imperative that we must make our move to remain united in every sense of the word. Because if we are united, as this fasting has shown us, then Allah will make it easy for us. He does not make it difficult for us.
And so, and that's why it is called a kitab. It is a physical book, a book of reference. It is a book because it's complete. It is a book because it's a book of guidance. And we take this so that we can then implement these lessons within ourselves. So on my final parting shot before the Azan from Maghrib, try to have a tangible objective that you can achieve in this year's Ramadan. Insha'Allah, by fasting, you'll be la'alakum tatakun. Masha'Allah, you'll be transformed. But that's intangible, and that's something that you cannot count. You need something that you can wake up every day, yes, I need to do this. I need to achieve this this year. And so what better way, knowing about the beauty of this month in celebrating the Quran, that try to encourage and have clusters of friends or with your family this year, I aim to memorize, for example, Surah an naba maybe, or Surah I don't know, Al Qiyamah, or, or, or maybe the most ambitious amongst us, Surah Al Baqarah, mashallah. Next year, Al Falah will invite you to become Imam Fatrawi. Right? Inshallah, you you never know, right? But you must have this tangible objective so that you have a purpose to achieve in this month. And so, in the last ten days, when you're doing your Kamulail. Uh, and you can come with your friends and say, okay, let me hear you. Let you then, then you check my memorization. And so then you say, MashaAllah, the Ramadan of 2013, I achieved by memorizing Surah an naba for example. And 2014, maybe Surah, I don't know, whatever Surah it is. And by the end of your life, inshallah, you might become a Hafiz. Or at least you recite the Quran regularly and you, your station on the Day of Judgment will be based on the last verse that you read. And so you see, we look at the Surah of the four righteous caliphs, the ones who were persecuted. They all recited verse that aids them on the Day of Account, inshallah. So I wish you a blessed Ramadan, and I hope you have a good iftar. Wa billahi taufiq wal hidayah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.